to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, so lately we've done some videos on SARMs and that's all good and fun and there are still a couple of them that I do want to take a deeper dive on and I started making those videos but I do miss peptides understandably. I am a buddy to the peptide and I keep tabs on latest articles on research and development and I've noticed that as of the past month there's a newly published trial on BPC-157 which is interesting because it was published after the ban on peptide compounding which the researchers discuss as well. And on top of that, it appears to have been conducted by some physicians affiliated with the University of Central Florida, and it doesn't have the compound's discoverer, Predrag Sikorich, listed as a contributing author, which if you've followed this channel for some time, you'll know that the great majority of pieces evaluating BPC-157 do indeed come from Sikorich or are in some way affiliated with his University of Zagreb. And since we're only reviewing one article, I'm going to refrain from pulling too many images directly from the source itself out of respect for the peer-reviewed journal in which it's published, but we'll be able to go through the publicly available abstract together at the very minimum. So this piece was published in a peer-reviewed journal called Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine, and it's titled Effect of BPC-157 on Symptoms in Patients with Interstitial Cystitis, a Pilot Study. And it took place in individuals who failed first-line treatment via a medication called pentacin polysulfate. So interstitial cystitis is characterized by bladder and pelvic discomfort. So much so, it's also known as painful bladder or bladder pain syndrome. And it's essentially a very uncomfortable, unclear disease state without great treatments available. And in the peptide space, when we hear terms like inflammation and pain, the peptide that most oftentimes comes to mind is, of course, BPC-157, our body protection compound, a pentadeca peptide derived from human gastric acid, most predominantly investigated in the context of injury and wound healing, of particular interest with regards to the GI tract given its derivation, but also involving the skin, the eye, musculoskeletal system, you name it. And I had previously hypothesized that the war waged against peptides, if you will, would prevent further clinical investigation in their utilization. But it turns out I was wrong. So this study took place in just 12 women, which of course is a small number to the critical eye, but it's worth our evaluation regardless. I'd say when it comes to reliability of results, questionnaires, more subjective measurements are usually lower from a scientific objective standpoint, but this is the tool the researchers use to quantify patient response. And on top of that, there wasn't a control group, a baseline with which to compare the participants involved in the experiment itself, which is really a standard in clinical research. So those are the limitations. There's certainly room for improvement, but this is 2024 research on BPC-157. How could we not take a look at it? Now, what's most fascinating here is the route of administration. BPC-157 was injected around the area of the bladder wall inflammation during a cystoscopy, which is an imaging modality where doctors essentially take a tube, place it through the urethra, and can ascend through the bladder, ureters, and into the kidneys. Now, down to the results. Per the researchers, data collected it indicated that six weeks later, there was complete resolution of symptoms in 10 out of 12 women, or in 83.33333333% of participants, which questionnaire aside is quite astonishing. The other two claimed 80% improvement and nobody dropped out of the study. And here's a pic of the questionnaire tool utilized just so we can see what they measured. So overall, the piece serves as an argument for more lenient regulation of compounding BPC-157, or at the minimum, further research into its possible clinical utility. And the researchers indicate a want to change it from its current placement on category two to category one, which would allow compounding pharmacies to produce it, which I'm not necessarily against. As I've said many times, in order to get legitimate research and truly know the long-term effects of these peptides, as well as their long-term risks and benefits, it would require safe and legitimate clinical research, which at the very minimum would necessitate safe production of these peptides. Because if all the research is taking place via this gray market where you don't even know what you're getting because there aren't consequences of getting illegitimate products, we're just in a catch-22 where we don't get research and our lack of safety is maximized. 
that's just where I stand. I know this one could be a bit dry for some, but in general, I do hope you found it interesting. I know it was short and sweet, and I really did want to just go through this one. And if you haven't already, I do encourage you to like and subscribe. It's the best way to help a small peptide buddy out. If you're looking for a way to further support the channel, the link to the Patreon will be in the description below. This video, as well as others, will be on there. Some are limited to the Patreon. Others are more of a first look. That said, I'd say the vast majority, at least 90%, are user requested. Regardless, I appreciate your time and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based, pull up a chair, let's get this straight, peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.